So the French, of course, had this idea of, quote, the rights of man. Um, and when their revolution got underway, they claimed that all human beings should be equal. Um, they even played around with women being equal, although in reality that never got off the ground very far, but the rhetoric was there. <laughs> um, so, you know, but they, they had this idea that all of human being, all human beings are basically fundamentally equal, so therefore they should all be treated the same. For instance, they began to insist that every person, men, women, high, low, state, whatever, be called by the term citizen. Everybody was a citizen. Burke, for better or worse, just strongly, strongly disagrees that this reflects reality, human reality. Um, he says they made this mistake of universalizing something that is particular or might be particular to a, uh, a people, right? It's like thinking that hereditary monarchy is the only lawful government in the world. So, you know, Burke might even have been able to entertain that somewhere in the world uh, there was a government that basically ran on French revolutionary principles. I mean, you could even think maybe certain points in democratic Athens, uh, there was some proximity to this principle um, in their democracy. Uh, but what works for one place doesn't work for the other, and inheritance is key, right? And he, he makes a huge deal of how the French um, threw away what they inherited, which was very precious and valuable in his view, in exchange for this very lightweight and um, unrealistic idea of complete uh, human equality. So he says, your constitution, speaking to the French, to Monsieur de Pont, but also to the French more generally, he says, your constitution, it is true, whilst you were out of possession, suffered waste and dilapidation, but you possessed in some parts of the walls and in all the foundations of a noble and venerable castle. You might have repaired those walls. You might have built on those old foundations. And he says a little bit further down, you had all these advantages in your ancient states, but you chose to act as if you had never been molded into civil society and had everything to begin anew, okay? You began ill because you began by despising everything that belonged to you. So he just literally thinks it's a huge mistake to throw out all of what you've, your society has managed to accumulate over time just because you can see that some of it is either wrong or doesn't make sense. He's basically arguing that it's worth spending the time and the messy effort to extricate the good and to only, you know, eventually eliminate what is truly bad, okay? Um, he references the rights of Englishmen as their particular rights um, coming from their ancient history and a state specially belonging to the people of this kingdom. He makes a point of emphasizing that revolution should be avoided if at all possible. It's interesting that he doesn't make the argument that, say, Thomas Hobbes, the proto-liberal thinker made, made earlier, um, that revolution should never take place. Right? Um, Burke believed that revolution should be a very last resort. Now, how you square that with the glorious revolution that he admired? Well, as I kind of suggested last time, perhaps he even knew that that wasn't a terribly legitimate revolution either. But since it happened and since the outcomes were good, and because the way it was done was not terribly radical, he decided that it's better to accept than reject it. Okay. Uh, but Yes, uh, even the American Revolution, from Burke's perspective here, would probably not qualify as an absolutely necessary one because you get the sense from reading this part of the reflections that the only reason this could possibly be um, justifiable would be an absolute necessity, you know, of horrible oppression or of, uh, you know, absolute starvation. Or, Actually, the, the French were more in that position um, than the English probably ever were uh, before the French Revolution because, you know, they were experiencing famine, 
They had um, ongoing like natural disasters. I think a drought had taken place. They, their the food prices were way up. Inflation, you know, was was going, and people just couldn't buy food, you know. So they really were kind of in desperate straits when this happened. And of course, the king uh, King Louis made a big mistake and called the Estates General because he was out of money to pay for all the things that he wanted to do. Um, and it hadn't been called since the early 17th century, uh, so well over uh, over a century and a half ago, uh, there was no memory of what the Estates General should do within the within the living memory of the people who were called. Um, oh, by the way, the, the Estates General that Louis called consisted of the the uh, clergy, the first estate, the nobles, the second estate, and the common people, the third estate, and. Um, Louis called them in order to galvanize support for uh, raising taxes and for, you know, collecting funds. Um, and uh, it just snowballed. It got out from an, his un, under his control. Uh, so it was a mistake for him. Um, and Burke is looking at this at the beginning. You know, this book, Reflections, was written at the beginning of the French Revolution, and he can see that the Estates General was very lopsided. There were more members, just like there are in the general population, there were more members of the third estate than of the first and second estate. And uh, the original plan Louis had was for each estate to have one vote. But as soon as the Estates General was called, um, the third estate got its own ideas and said, no, that's, you know, we're, we're like 98% of the population, so therefore we need to have more votes. We need one man, one vote, basically, here. And since their estate outnumbered the first two in the assembly, um, they would have then ruled. When Louis balked, they separated, and that's what began the French Revolution. Um, so, you know, looking at the very beginning of the revolution, Burke sees that this, uh, you know, sudden break, right, in which the third estate begins to make its own decisions, begins to disrespect the tradition and the authority and the, uh, you know, the legitimacy and the authority of the, the first and second estate, that this, this act is radical enough that it, it snowballs, right? So this kind of encapsulates a Burkean principle, you might say, um, the principle that of unintended consequences, that once you start something, you don't know wh who, who or what is going to take it from there. He says, France, when she let loose the reins of regal authority, doubled the license of a ferocious dissoluteness in manners and of all insolent irreligion in opinions and practices. One of the first things that the Third Estate did when it it, it called it basically became its became its own assembly, is it called to abolish the uh, the First Estate, and then pretty soon it it wanted to take the and it did um, confiscate the property of the church and dissolve the churches uh, as, as institutions in France. Um, and as time went by, the license in doing that turned into license more generally. You know, I mean, literally, if you can think the unthinkable and you can do what nobody ever thought could be done, then what else can you do, right? And pretty soon um, it, it became uh, a wild affair the French Revolution did. And Burke, even though he wrote this very early on, could see that it was going to become that, that within it was this snowballing radicalism. Um, now, another aspect of, of Burke's thought that comes out here, I would call a sort of fondness or a subtle affection for the noble lie. We've already seen that he says that during the Glorious Revolution, the English uh, Parliament threw a, quote, uh, well-wrought veil over their proceedings and uh, tried not to make very much of the fact that they had basically decided to depose one king and to bring on uh, two different monarchs. Uh, you know, so William and Mary uh, were going to be kind of conceived of as in the line of succession, there was a, he says, a slight deviation from the line of succession, but truly, and that the 
monarchy, the hereditary monarchy was preserved and they did everything they could to downplay the fact that the parliament had made that choice. Um, that doesn't mean though that it didn't make that choice, uh, but it understood that making a big deal of making that choice and not kind of shoving it under the rug would create a snowball effect. So they were conservative in their radicalism, you might say. And Burke admires that. I think he understands um, that, you know, it, it was, it was a revolution, right? Um, but nevertheless, it was done in the most politic way possible. And in his own rhetoric, he doubles down on that and perpetuates the idea that this was really um, an act with very little revolutionary substance to it, an act in full agreement with the traditions in England. And he probably, he's got to know that's not true, okay, is what I'm thinking. Um, but the noble lie, I have a picture of Socrates there because he came up with the term in, in the Republic, Pla or, well, Plato did in the Republic. And we put noble lies in place to kind of smooth over decisions and structures which would otherwise cause this kind of snowball disturbance, right? And if and you want to legitimize it, in the case of the Republic, um, there was a whole mythology proposed to legitimize um, putting people into these different classes, the rulers, the soldiers, and the common people. Burke conceives of something similar here going on, and he wonders why the French couldn't figure this out. Um, you can make a change, uh, but you shouldn't make a radical and noticeable change so noticeable that everybody in society gets ideas that they can just do whatever they want, okay? And so one of the things that Burke does here is he sort of does a noble lie when it comes to ranks and types. He upholds the traditional feudal or aristocratic notion that there are men of different qualities in society, okay? And when dealing with looking at the French and uh, the Estates General and at particularly the lower class, the third estate, he does a he he goes on at some length uh, to uh, sort of diss them as being low, sordid types, uh, common and as common, unworthy of uh, taking any part in ruling. He says that the very best of these people were only men of theory, which I suppose is you know the intellectuals, the professors. So. So when he thinks of greatness, he's not thinking of the, the philosopher type. He's thinking of the noble, landed, aristocrat of intellectual substance, okay? And these people were not that. Uh, he, t he goes on about the common mechanical lawyers who, you know, were not the brilliant legal minds, right? But just the country lawyers who were out there doing your, your like, your estate planning or whatever. I don't know. Um, he uses the term country clowns to describe people like, you know, country merchants, uh, curates or ministers and small town doctors. These were the kind of people that showed up to represent the third estate. Brokers, you know, men involved in, uh, in uh, making money from money, which he doesn't think much of bankers, this type. They were good at what they did, he said. They were good at what they did, but they should not be asked to rule because that's not what they do. That's not what they know. And again, that's kind of like you know Plato's point of view in the Republic, right? That um, each type of man has his forte, his strength, right? Um, and it's an injustice, Plato argued, uh, for the worker class to try to rule, just as it is for the soldiers to try to rule. And it would be an injustice to make people of the philosopher king class, in that view, um, to work, um, you know, in some mechanical task. So Burke has this, you know, he embraces this and he says, 
Such descriptions of men ought not to suffer oppression from the state, but the state suffers oppression if such as they, either individually or collectively, are permitted to rule. In this you think you are combating prejudice, but you are at war with nature. Okay, so he's, he's embracing this idea that there are natural distinctions and that the quality of a person a person should determine what role they play in society, and these common courts should not be playing much of a role, if any at all. Um, but yet at the same time, Burke is famous for establishing the idea of natural aristocracy. Elsewhere in this book, he will refer to, you know, talent and intellect and depth as the primary qualifications for who should lead. And he's capable of understanding that not every aristocrat has those qualities. There are two types of aristocrats, at least. The type that um, is kind of the playboy, you know, the silly, the silly guy whose like main enjoyments are playing cards and, you know, hunting and having like, cocktail parties. Okay, um, and then there's the type that actually takes their role seriously, spends time reading, discussing, writing, and patronizing people like Edmund Burke, right? Um, and also, and this is where we have to remember, Burke himself was not an aristocrat, but was raised up by aristocrats. He received that patronage, and by participating in it, he also obtains the status of the natural aristocracy. He is a part of it, but only in a sort of strange subservience or ranking beneath the landed aristocracy, okay? So he, his own position very much illustrates how he views these ranks, right? He couldn't do it on his own, and one gets the sense that he wouldn't have thought to, but rather the way to influence if one had the talent and ability Burke had, was to, uh, to, to find an aristocratic family to give you those privileges and to promote your abilities and influences in the world. So he himself is living under a politic, well-wrought veil. And the infuriating but also kind of neat thing about Burke's thinking is that there's a certain hypocrisy that is absolutely crucial for keeping the peace, right? Um, a certain hypocrisy in which everybody's feelings and everybody's prejudice are somewhat vindicated and also somewhat thwarted. He could not be himself an aristocrat, but he could exercise his talents and abilities by working for aristocrats. The English could have a different constitution, but it could keep the peace and satisfy everybody's sensibilities to a certain extent by throwing a well-wrought veil over the fact that they had a revolution in 1688. And he's asking, why can't you French figure this out? So I've introduced the idea that hypocrisy um, can actually be a good thing. You know, we tend to uh, admire honesty so much. Of course, nobody practices it, but we admire it greatly. And so hypocrisy seems to be, uh, you know, a negative quality for us. I don't think Burke would have liked me using the term, but I do think Burke is making the argument for a certain type of hypocrisy.